In addition to multiple system atrophy, another disease that we focus on is called familial dysautonomia, or the longer term is hereditary sensory and autonomic neuropathy. This is a, a genetic disease, of course is hereditary, is autosomal recessive, meaning both parents have to be carriers of the disease for uh, the child to, to be affected, is expressed at birth, meaning the symptoms are there since the person is, is the patient is born, and is also a, a brutal disease, is devastating. Uh, patients have abnormalities of their autonomic nervous system, but they also have difficulty swallowing, and uh, one of the main features, or the dramatic features, is that they have insensitivity to pain. They do not feel pain. So um, the disease was described in 1949 by two pediatricians in New York um, called Riley and Day, and they described five children that all of them looked different, but they had enough in common as to call their attention and realize that there was a syndrome. And what they had in common was that they didn't respond to pain. They didn't cry when they, their feet were submerged in cold water. And they had no tears. So this was called the disease without tears. So um, the disease, uh, they thought that it was genetic. Years later, the genetic defect was identified, and we, we understand this, of course, much better now. Interestingly, two years after the disease was described, parents of affected children started the foundation uh, that was a small foundation then. It has grown. Uh, it's called the Dysautonomia Foundation and supports um, heavily the Dysautonomia Center at NYU. And can you uh, sort of describe how the foundation and the hospital and sort of the patients uh, sort of work together to uh, generate more information and help you manage the condition? Sure, how is it manage sure, well? sure. You know, <clears throat> Um, we, we were able to, to put together um, really a, a partnership of um, five sort of members, right? We have an academic institution that is New York University. We have federal agencies that provide funding, both the National Institute of Health and the Food and Drug Administration. Also, a private foundation, which is the uh, Dysautonomia Foundation, and of course, the patients themselves. So, all this together, we have been able to um, really establish a strong partnership that provides uh, care for these patients. We centralize the medical care of all patients with this disease around the world. Um, they come either once a year if they live outside the states, or if they are in the tri-state area, they, they come much more frequently. But we centralize their care, and by centralizing their care and getting the clinical information of all these patients, we have been able to really be a sort of one-stop uh, shopping in which this is a real translational research center that we are able to apply what comes from the lab directly to the clinic and apply new treatments to, to patients with this terrible disease. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, a cure for, for the disease. We only have symptomatic treatments. So um, we we have been developing a number of new treatments for the symptoms, but hope that uh, we will be able to find the cure. I hope that in my lifetime we will be able to find the cure. Um, in fact, we, we have um, a number of uh, genetic therapies 
One of them is a compound called kinetin that corrects the splicing defect, which is responsible for the disease. Interestingly, this compound was identified in a screening that NINDS, the neurological um, branch of NIH, did a number of years ago. This was identified as a compound that could correct the splicing defect. Um, after that, we, with Sue Slagerhaupt, Dr. Slagerhaupt, who's the scientist that discovered the gene responsible for the disease, we had um, six years of funding in what's called the blueprint to develop um, drugs from the initial stage to what's called the valley of death, in which uh, drugs many times uh, sort of disappear because there's not enough expertise of funding to develop them and take them to phase three clinical trials. So in these uh, six years, with um, collaborations from um, a number of chemists and uh, basic scientists, there are, uh, the, the initial compound has been modified to be much more um, efficient than the initial compound, and we are close to um, starting phase three or phase two clinical trials with these new, uh, with these candidate compounds. And for that, we have partnered with um, a, a private biotech company that's called PTC that will also um, has, has been interested in developing further this compound and take it to the clinic.